Hey guys, today we're talking about the Thea Audio Legacy 3. This is the hottest new IEM coming out of China. Very interesting design. Um, it It's priced at around 120 bucks entry, and then you can customize it in various options up from there. This particular model is $130. Um, so let's talk about what you get in the box. We'll talk about what's good, build, then sound. And then what's bad, sound, and build, and then wrap it all up, kind of bookend it. First of all, what you get in the box, the shells themselves. This is the cable that you can expect with them. It's a QDC connector, rubberized, with a nice Y split. Then a pretty bulky, unfortunately, um, 3.5 millimeter termination. Um, it works fine, it's gold plated, definitely usable but it doesn't have any real strain relief and this is a problem. I expect this to be a point of failure and you can kind of see after two months of use, it's showing somewhere on the cable itself. And I'm quite careful with it. Let's get the cable out of view. You get a standard selection of tips, which are pretty basic. I have a bunch of other ones laid out up here that we'll talk about fairly shortly. But the last thing that you get in the box, and I have to move these out of the way to make room for it, is a carry case. And this thing is ridiculous. At first I was quite upset about it. Uh, it is unnecessarily bulky, and I stand by that. However, I will confess that it has allowed me to do something pretty special. So not only can I fit the IEMs, and their cable, let's pretend that it's nicely tucked in there, and a bunch of spare ear tips, but I can also fit in a portable amplifier. In this case, this is my Fio BTR5, and this is what I've been using for the most part, right? Tuck it all in, make sure it's, the cable's nicely wrapped, and I have for myself a portable studio. So as much as I think the, the case is a complete overreach in terms of size, I can't say I haven't used it. So your mileage may vary. You may not be using these for the same purposes. You may not be wanting to have a portable amplifier, although this is definitely a recommended pairing. If you can use it, it is a uh, pretty convenient little uh, portable box where you can have everything. Otherwise, it's so big and bulky, it is way too big for just the IEMs and the cable. So, as far as good in terms of build quality, if I give you a closer look, the first thing that should be obvious is that these are quite beautiful. Taking a close look at these, you will no doubt immediately notice patterns are quite different. They're hand done and so they will vary from unit to unit, not just between the two but between sets. At least in this finish and the clockwork finish, it's going to be quite unique. It's cool to have this kind of a touch in a fairly low-end universal IEM, but beyond that you actually get to customize these to your pleasure. On Lin Sol's webpage, which I'll link in the description, you get to customize both the body of the shell and the faceplate to one of their many options out there. And uh, I've imagined myself making quite a few different configurations. <laughs> Not gonna lie, I've spent more time than I should on that configurator. And the price goes up from 120 bucks whenever you choose to customize them. And we'll talk about why you may want to do so in the later portion of this review, but as it stands, it's an amazing option at this price point. Speaking of the price point, even fully configured, a universal set will not will not run you more than two hundred dollars. It'll be just under that. And the amazing thing about that is you can actually spend just a few bucks more, just over two hundred bucks, and get these fully custom molded to your ears. You send them to your ear impressions, and they make you custom in ear monitors. And considering some things we'll talk about soon, that is amazing. That's a steal. Another good thing about the, the build, the fit is amazing. These feel like they have been built for my ears. I know that's not true, but I've tried a bunch of other universal IEMs, including the Voyager 3 from PA Audio, 
which is the three balanced armature version of this. If I haven't mentioned, this has a dynamic driver for the base and two balanced armatures, one for the mids, one for the highs, respectively. But that Voyager 3 was too big. It did not fit into my ears comfortably. It would push itself out as I'm using it over the course of a few songs. And it just, it never felt right. I couldn't get a right seal, and if I did, it would wear away quickly. These, on the other hand, maybe it's because of the way that this is scalped or scooped out, uh, it allows the fit to be deep. These are comfortable. Depending on what tips I use, they fit very deeply, flush to my ear. Um, I can even sleep in these. And the sound doesn't change when I put my head on the pillow. It's quite amazing. It's very rare that I've had such a comfortable fit with the Universal AM. Um, these are spectacular, and I hope that this experience translates to as many people as possible, because for me, it was quite amazing. Another good and interesting thing about the build is that this is a properly researched and implemented three driver crossover. This day and age, you can go to any number of Chinese makers, um, KZ for example, and for below or at a hundred bucks, you can get five drivers, six drivers per ear, 10 drivers per ear. It's pretty crazy. However, I cannot vouch for any amount of research and tuning that goes into something like that. This on the other hand, is a coherent crossover that works wonders. So as far as bang for the buck for a multi-driver earbud, these are fantastic. You can tell that there has been deliberate time spent tuning these to make sure you get the most out of these drivers. These are quite easy to power. Um, I never have to go over half volume steps on low gain on single-ended on this, and if I put it in balanced, I never go over 33%. Um, you can run these balanced with the proper cable, um, and it actually seems to do a little bit of something something to the low end. As far as the sound goes, these were very surprising to me. The tuning is spectacular. If I was to, to mention something that's great, you know, what's What's the special sauce? What's the thing that sets these apart from any other IEM in its price range? And that is easily, and by far, the tuning, the sound signature. Um, if you look into the nozzle, you can see right there, you have two different boards. One with a red filter that leads to the balanced armature drivers, the mid-range and the highs which are kind of stacked on top of each other here and have a tube together that goes down. You can see it clearly in the Clockworks um, shell because it's clear. And the other tube goes to the dynamic driver, which is um, isolated from the rest of the drivers and has its own vent hole right there. So let's go through this um, step by step. Let's first talk about the base. Now, this is definitely a highlight for the Legacy 3. They use a dynamic driver in the base, and it's a very high quality driver. It's fast, it has all the texture that you want. Uh, I was really impressed with this. Um, there's a song by Diana Krall called All or Nothing at All. And um, very often I have problems with that song in terms of bass speed and texture, bass bleeding into the mids. Um, for example, the Blonde BL-03, excellent for their price. Actually, excellent all around, really. Uh, but that's one thing that they, they struggle with. In that song, you have an upright bass at the beginning, and Diana Krall's voice, which is a particularly low female voice. Uh, but it's supposed to sound distinct from the bass coming from the instrument. And this does a fantastic job of keeping those two separate and you get all the detail in the strings of the upright bass and all the texture and warmth of her voice without any masking, at least any masking that I can hear. And I've had issues with that in far more expensive IEMs, even in speakers, towers. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty difficult song actually to get right and these do fantastically. Another bass test, if you will, there's a song by Halos called Earth Not Above. There's a recording of it live on YouTube from KEXP, which is a radio station in Seattle, I think. And it's not a fantastic recording, actually. The bass is blown way out of proportion. On most 
headphones, well, maybe not most headphones, but many headphones, it sounds blown out. It overpowers everything else in the mix. I kid you not, the first time I heard these, that song on these, I thought that my speakers in the room were also playing at the same time and I could feel a subwoofer. But that's not what was happening. These things felt like subwoofers in my ears. Um, they reach very low, they remain clean, and for the first time in a long time, um, that song did not sound muddy or bloated, even though the bass was way louder than it should have been in that mix. It sounded clean, textured, fast, fun. I loved it. Go give that song a listen. Halos, Earth Not Above from KEXP. So the mid mid-range is quite warm especially for male vocalists. Avi Kaplan, for example, sounds wonderful here. Um, Will Regan also has a song called Round and Round. If you listen to it, there's a lot of mid-range texture. His voice goes through a lot of different expressions um, and it's, it's, it's deep and warm and subdued when it needs to be. And then it's sparkly and high and loud when it needs to be. Um, these do a very good job with the mid-range as far as vocals go, especially male vocals. I did find that female vocals can occasionally be a little bit cold, a little bit shouty, and we'll talk about more why that can be in a little bit. Other instruments in the mid-range um, have a lot of body. Electric guitars sound fantastic. Um, Opeth has a song, Harlequin Forest. The whole way through, different textures of guitar distorted electric, clean acoustic com combination of both. Um, both the vocals, the electric guitar, they come together in such a wonderful way. That song carries all of the, the power in the distorted vocals and all of the airiness in the clean melodic parts. It is a wonderful listen on these. Generally speaking, actually, I found that classic rock, metal, acoustic music, anything that has um, real stringed instruments was shiny, absolutely, on these. Um, that's not to say that electronic music was bad, um, by no means, but I think they, they, they shine absolutely with analog instruments and not primarily digitally uh, created music. Although I do listen to that as well, so don't, don't take that as a condemnation or a judgment. As far as the highs go, I'll say they're not what I expected. They're good, they're very sweet, there's quite a bit of detail. And what they do best probably is to preserve a lot of that detail and avoid the vast majority of sibilance and pain. So what they seem to have is a pretty substantial dip between 6 and 8K. It, it dips down at 6 and it reaches back up by, by 8K. Most S's are in that valley and so it doesn't mute them completely. Um, you still hear them nice and distinct but they, they don't tend to hurt. Every once in a while you'll, in, you'll find a singer whose S's reach higher in that frequency range and they hit, hit the 8K peak and you can definitely hear a little bit more of that uh, strong S sound. But it's not even consistent from person to person. Sometimes the same person in the same song has S's that are very calm and soft and easy to listen to and an S that just pops through a little harder. After that 8K spike, there's a gradual decline and I don't have a whole lot of information beyond 12K or so. Um, I don't think you need that most of the time, but it would have been nice if this was a more complete offering in the, um, in the highs. I wish that um, just a couple decibels above 11, 12K, it would have really completed the sound for me. Uh, but as far as the sound signature goes, the timbre, of these is so natural and so wonderful. They really are a jack of all trades and a master of many. The vast majority of acoustic songs, and not just acoustic, but analog instruments, those that are not digitally produced, they sound magical. There is something incredibly um, sweet about these. They're not flat, but there's no imbalance that throws the frequency response off um, in a major way. Um, there are slight emphases in, uh, in the bass, slight emphases in the upper mid range, but none of it is distracting and all of it really just 
brings forth all of the intimacy, the excitement, the detail in music that we all want to hear. So that's what's great. These at 120 bucks are some of the most engaging IEMs I've ever heard. And I have heard um, quite a few. We'll, we'll talk about comparisons close to the end. Let's talk about some negatives because it's not all sugar and cookies. Unfortunately, I mentioned that spike at 8K. It plays along with another spike around 2K. Now, that one's a lot gentler. The approach angle of the frequency response and the decay afterwards is quite a lot smoother than the one at 8K. But combine those two and on some tracks, especially something like classical music with woodwind instruments or like trumpet or a particularly aggressive female singer that goes into the highs in an opera song or something like that. Something that hits that spike at 2K and then you have something else that's triggering the sibilance at 8K at the same time. Those are the only instances where I had to lower the volume. Every other time I, I felt like I would never reach the ceiling. I just kept wanting to turn these louder and louder and louder. Only on those few occasions, that is an issue. Um, just beware, if you primarily listen to um, other types of music, you don't really touch too much classical or opera, you shouldn't really have um, an issue. So this is like, for my library at least, like three songs out of 50, something, something like that. So not a real concern, but something that I thought you should know. Probably the most disappointing thing about the sound itself is how much tips make a difference. Um, I was pretty surprised by this. The tips that come in the box sound great, uh, but they didn't stay in my ears. I had a hard time sealing them. And when I did, then they would come off of the IEMs. The IEM would fall out and the tip would stay in, which is dumb. So I've been trying out different tips and the size of the bore, the um, shape of the of the shaft itself, whether it's flanged out or, or um, parallel, cylindrical, the material, all of it seems to change the sound. And that's kind of disappointing. So let me explain a little bit. These are Sedna ear fit, I think, something like that. They have a very wide bore and these seem to be the most balanced um, of all the, the tips I've tried. Uh, they retain the detail and the treble, they don't become harsh. The bass stays nice and controlled, the mids are um, forward enough exactly where you want that intimacy and um, the sound stage is preserved, imaging is really good. Foam tips kill the bass and hide the detail in the treble, which is really disappointing. I don't know exactly why this happens. These are Deconi tips, I've tried others as well, it seems to be the same effect. Um, really disappointed by that. I prefer foam tips on these types of IAMs for long periods of listening. Um, these are some basic ear tips that come from Tin Hi-Fi. These unfortunately really make the bass boomy. You can see that the, the bore is a lot narrower. Um, and sometimes even the highs tend to come a little more sharply. You lose a little bit of that intimacy in the mid-range. The only other ones that really do a, a fantastic job are these guys. These are Symbio ear tips. They're a nice hybrid. They have a silicon out um, layer and foam insert around. Pretty spendy, kind of hard to get. You can definitely get the vast majority of the benefit of this sound with the stock ear tips if they fit you. But otherwise, you're gonna have to start rolling tips. Try, try whatever you have. Another thing that's not fantastic about these are the dip switches. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is that you get like a SIM removal tool. This one exactly in the box. And this is to flip the dip switches. For some reason, mine do nothing at all. I have tried it extensively with both, you know, all four configurations and it sounds the same. And Critical confirmed this with his graph. Other people have graphed them and they say, you know, there's definitely a difference. Other people without graphs say they can hear a difference. I can't. Um, I'm not ultimately complaining because I like the stock sound. I wouldn't want it to be different. I don't want to touch it. I want to leave these as they are. They're magical. So dip switches, no benefit. Super duper gimmicky. Um, the last thing that I don't like um, 
before we get to something that could be a deal breaker is the cable. I already mentioned the problem with the um, you know, this part. It's quite big, quite bulky. But the cable itself is just very sticky. It's rubbery and it tends to grip everything that I walk by. It's a little annoying. It's pretty easy to find QDC cables to switch, but unfortunately that leads us to the biggest design flaw, and that is this connector. I'm gonna bring it close. You see how cracked this is? Yeah. This is the biggest flaw of the design. Um, the connector itself is very brittle. Um, cracks, it actually isn't really up to tolerance. So the cable itself tends to come loose while using it. After a few hours, I have found that particularly the one on my right ear would just come loose and I'd find myself with an IEM stuck in my ear and a cable dangling below, uh, which is no good. What you can do, which I don't necessarily want to recommend, because this is a hack. We shouldn't have to do this. Um, I have used a tiny amount of Gorilla Glue, this particular type that is for um, usually clear plastics, um, and just put a ring around it with some application tool. Um, it tends to fill the cracks and it increases the diameter just a touch. You let it dry for a night, and then in the morning, when you put this in, it's snug and it stops falling apart. However, this is stupid. If this was made out of metal, that wouldn't happen. That would be an appropriate IEM to use this design on. But this acrylic cracks. And they know this, because if you go to their website uh, on Linsoul and you look at the, customi the customizer, all of the higher end customizations go back to a normal two pin connector, right? The one that's recessed. And so if, if you use this type of connector where this is recessed, if ever something happens and the cable gets pulled, what breaks is the cable and not the IEM connector itself, which in this case would be what breaks. And you can't really use these, these cables because that looks abysmal. Now look at that weak spot right there. That just, that is asking for a bend and a crack and a snap. It's really bad. So I hope that they will address this in future runs and switch all of them to the recess tubing connector. But if they don't, is it worth it to spend a little more and get one of the custom options that comes with the right connector? I would say absolutely yes. Under $200, there's nothing that I have heard that pleases my ears better. I understand they're probably flatter sounding IEMs. There may be some that have more technical proficiency because they're using more drivers, but to my ears, uh, I have not heard something that more pleases me when listening to my library. To give you some comparisons, the Voyager 3, which were these guys, Big Brother. Those were too sharp, the bass was too sloppy, and they wouldn't fit in my ears. These are um, much smoother, much more enjoyable, and the bass is phenomenal. Um, these here that have been sitting in the corner this whole time, the Shure SE215, um, these are a standard in cheap monitoring, especially stage monitoring, and I don't understand why. Um, sure, they're relatively inexpensive, around 100 bucks, 120 bucks, depending on where you buy them. Um, and they're comfortable, they fit quite nicely in your ear, but they're nothing close to flat or neutral. They sound bloated, the bass is boomy and exaggerated, the mid range is nasally and missing all the warmth and um, texture that you need, it's not intimate. The highs are much darker. Uh, above 8K, there's almost no information there. Um, and it's peaky all throughout the treble. There are little ringing spots. Even though this is not a neutral IEM, even this is a much better, much more recommendable stage monitoring headphone than this. The natural 
capability of this to give you an accurate replay is far, far better than anything this can do. So all you stage musicians that want something on the cheap, keep listening. There's something important to say. The Tin Hi-Fi T4, um, they're an interesting comparison. Uh, single dynamic driver, less comfortable, less detailed, uh, less bass. Also, overall, these are actually around the same price and um, overshadow them in every way. The Tin P1, those were interesting because of the texture and speed of the mid-range. They were monsters for the mid-range. And I've been looking for something that can really capture that same um, dynamic warmth that those had. And these are the closest that I've, I've come to. Um, and they're really, really close. So imagine a P1 level of mid-range with no compromise in the bass and almost no compromise in the highs. This is fantastic. I've been looking for something like this for a long time and I'm so happy that I have them. Lastly, the Blonde BL-03. They, they have something in common with this in terms of tuning. Um, the bass is more exaggerated than the BL-03 and it doesn't reach quite as deep. Uh, I feel like this reaches deeper, although it's not as boomy. You can definitely hear the drivers struggle a little bit in busy tracks where these have three different drivers with an appropriate crossover. There's more, more separation, better staging, better imaging. But if these fit you, and you're willing to deal with a bad cable or you have something to switch it to and you can find ear tips that'll seal for about 30 bucks you can get something kind of similar actually i still think this is a better value for your money because it's a complete experience it works out of the box um, at least if the ear tips fit you um, this is a lot more work but if you don't have the money to spend for this the blo 3s are a budget legend for a good reason, so don't disregard them. I have talked for way too long. Um, I hope this wasn't excessively boring, but I'm trying to be as informative as I can. My recommendation would be, if they do not change the connector, spring for the more expensive ones. And if you can afford 120 bucks, save for another few weeks, you can afford 160 bucks, or whatever they are running nowadays. It would be a shame for this connector to break and for your precious IEMs to be useless. These are so good and they should last you a really long time. And so what I'm planning to do is to sell these to someone who wants them and buy the custom ones. If I don't have to deal with tips, changing the sound and have something that fits me perfectly with this sound signature, these are fantastic value, definitely recommended. Keep in mind those caveats and if you can't deal with um, this connector at this time, either wait or get the more expensive one. Um, although it feels bad to say that. So this is definitely a design flaw. It's definitely on the audio. It's, it's their fault. Um, you shouldn't have released it in this state. But that's really the biggest negative. For 120 bucks, these are a fantastic value. A jack of all trades and a master of many. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them in the comments. I am sorry for how long this has taken, but I hope that I've given you all of the information that you need in your purchase decision. Yes, there's hype around these, but most of it is deserved. See you later.